Um, so indeed, I, I feel after seeing uh, the presentation uh, just shown to us that there's quite a lot of similarities, but there's also quite some differences. And this is what's interesting to, to look at. My talk will be primarily about um, the, the way uh, of planning in the Netherlands in the sense of uh, starting up a process of negotiation and a certain strife for consensus. Um, but in order to do that, I need to introduce the concept a little bit, and, um, and then I will try to embark on uh, ways of um, uh, well, ways of organizing planning um, in formal and informal ways. So um, the the Landstad is, is one of the is part of one of the uh, densest part of Europe. So basically, you see around here the lighting up in the night sky uh, of Europe, um, having one of the most densely urbanized regions. But paradoxically, uh, at the same time, uh, it's a place where uh, in Europe uh, there's one of the lowest urban densities. So this is really important to understand. There is a lot of urbanization, but low density. Um, relatively. Um, when, when we zoom in a bit, uh, we can see uh, the Ramstad area uh, set between the large metropolises of, the, of Paris, uh, London, uh, Berlin, still physical, and the um, very urbanized regions of Flanders with uh, Brussels in the middle and, and the Ruhr area. Um, the Ramstad bringing together about half of the Dutch population, 8 million people, uh, in, and also uh, obviously concentrated most of the economic uh, developments are going on in the western part, the low-lying part of the Netherlands. So this low-lying is one of the crucial parts of the development of the Randstad. Uh, the Randstad is set in the delta. So, uh, border territory between sea and land, and this, of course, throughout the ages is, is both a handicap um, because of the devastation of uh, the, the protective dikes uh, now and again in, uh, throughout centuries. Um, but it's also an advantage, of course, very fertile soil and uh, being on um, um, on the crossroad of the. Um, River system of the Rhine, the Meuse, the, the Schelde, so basically a very large hinterland uh, crossing with the international trade routes uh, on, the, uh, on the oceans ahead. So basically, from the Middle Ages, um, this situation was uh, used uh, to its utmost uh, advantage. But this also led to a, a process um, where uh, currently, we can compare the Netherlands most, uh, geophysically speaking, uh, uh, most directly with a bowl. So, with an, uh, uh, if we would not protect uh, the area um, uh, of the of the Randstad, uh, almost it would almost completely uh, disappear below sea level. So, if if there would be no dike system, it would flood up to five or six meters. So continuously, this land is being come dry, right, um, with literally hundreds of different uh, water levels, uh, which are being kept into centimeter precision by a sort of mutual agreement between agriculture and water bodies. So uh, continuous negotiation is um, is is of uh, primary importance uh, for the Dutch to be uh, existing. And um, this brought forward also a quite particular landscape that we, worldwide, we, we got to know through uh, Dutch landscape and painting in the 17th century, um, where you would see um, basically uh, the landscape that brought forward two very typical uh, cultures, let's say. The land excavated, being kept dry continuously, was too expensive to, to be left there. So it was very intensively used, so really up to the inch indeed. Uh, every inch uh, was being put into practice. And farmers lived on their own land, so being free farmers, hardly any villages uh, 
uh, starting from Iraq, but never far away uh, cities uh, where the concentration of trade was uh, uh, concentrated uh, appeared uh, along the river beds where uh, the soil is, is strong enough to, to sustain uh, build development. So basically very free both in farming and in uh, sort of middle class town, but both very free, very actively involved people with um, their country. Um, now to the last of them, it's a very well known and often told story that uh, aviation pioneer uh, Albert Plessemont, the founder of the KLM, the Royal Dutch Airlines, invented the non-stop while flying over in the beginning of the century, last century, flying over uh, the low lying Holland. He was looking for a place to position his airport. Uh, he saw a ring of cities with an empty core. So the Randstad literally meaning a ring with an empty heart. Of course, this is a very nice story, but truth is that the Randstad was invented as a planning concept um, in post-war uh, planning uh, era. Um, and with the idea of developing uh, a ring of cities into uh, sort of true metropolitan uh, development, however, with an empty green heart. So when this idea was formulated in 1950, around and about, uh, the answer was somewhat like this. Um, basically, city set into a green agricultural land, um, which hardly changed in the last uh, three uh, centuries. Uh, when we look at it now, uh, it looks like this. Of course, a completely different image, and like in most um, areas in the world, uh, the post-war period gave, gave rise to very uh, extensive uh, urban growth, and uh, eventually to an almost uninterrupted sort of urban field with all different kinds of functions, uh, with a big harbor, with the uh, glass houses, uh, with the agricultural land in between, uh, sort of mixed um, together and hardly distinguishable one from another. Of course it's visible that there has been some sort of planning policy implemented, but maybe it's even more visible where it did not really uh, got what it wanted. Um, so when you when you look at the growth map of the of the from um, uh, the last century, you can see that uh, before the war, uh, more or less the urban area uh, quadrupled, and after the war again. But you can also see that it's all of these little cores, all of these historic towns, which in one area or another played a very important role, Amsterdam, Rotterdam, The Hague, Utrecht, Leiden, Delft, etc. Uh, all sort of in themselves expanded. Of course, nowadays, um, it's not um, necessarily the, the cities com competing with each other, but more in a globalized world, and uh, maybe even more specifically with the European integration going on, it's the urbanized regions within Europe which are uh, competing with each other and which are continuously looking at each other, um, comparing themselves uh, through numerous uh, indicators. Um, here showing a graph which is updated on a yearly basis, basically to compare all of uh, the indicators of these urbanized regions. And when we look at it, the Randstad is somewhere in the middle. It's is performing quite well on certain things, of course, transshipment, etc., and employment being quite well, but in others it's failing quite significantly. Labor productivity is relatively low uh, in the Netherlands, um, capacity of railways, frighteningly low, uh, high tech jobs, we're really lagging behind. So, um, of course, it's, it's interesting to look at these graphs also really in, in the sense of uh, comparing to each other. But this also um, serves as a running ground to understand what should be uh, done next. What is the next important step? And um, the way uh, the Randstad is being planned at the moment, it, yeah, you can say in diagram, you can uh, 
uh, look at it uh, more or less like this. A couple of historically mostly grown, internationally competing uh, uh, complexes, with of course the harbor being very important, um, uh, logistics around Schiphol, very important, but also agriculture still playing very important roles. So a number, at least five of these very important internationally operating clusters set in a um, sort of very well um, organized um, international um, accessible accessibility scheme placed among um, a sort of a large urban field um, between the four major cities of, uh, of the Landstad. But there's hardly anything which uh, mediates between these two. There's hardly any infrastructures uh, being in, in the sense of transport, but also in the sense of landscape or in the sense of uh, economic activities that, um, and that connect the top um, to the bottom. And not only is it sort of inefficient, but also at, this, at the moment we are confronted ever more with the consequences. So you can even see in sort of daily newspaper the, uh, uh, the, the, the end is inside for a lot of structures that were historically uh, building up uh, the Hansel area. For instance, the water system. Um, this is just an article uh, about um, a dike that suddenly gave way. Actually not being because there was too much water, but because there's too little water. In the summer period, the dike dried out and was pushed aside. Of course, uh, this is a, a, a relatively innocent example. Uh, but it serves as a warning. Um, and you can also see it, for instance, in the, in the way uh, um, the traditional agriculture is uh, um, able to uh, sustain pressure against um, sort of autonomous urbanizing uh, principles. So um, all of these little towns each grow and eat up together every day uh, the size of the uh, Central Park of Amsterdam continues, and we don't know where uh, it goes to. And most notably, of course, uh, one of the major problems in the Hansel area is uh, the problem of uh, almost limited uh, congestion. Um, and in that congestion, it needs to be said, um, because primarily of the morphology of the Hansel area, a car takes in a very important role. So if you see the a division of the modes of transport from 1960 to uh, 2000, you see that almost everything stayed stable except for the explosive growth of car uh, usage. Okay, now the, the, the government and governance system that is in place in planning the Hansstadt um, is quite um, of complexly organized. There are at least three governmental levels, and maybe we can say even six if we count uh, also the EU uh, and the lower uh, working together of different municipalities, but three formal uh, sort of administrative uh, levels. A very highly centralized taxing system, so almost 90% of all taxes is brought in through the state. This again is spent in a very sectorally devised uh, uh, financial organization. So either it's spent on infrastructure or it's spent on housing or etc. etc. Very, um, very strong subdivisions between them. But on the other hand, a very, very strong local autonomy in urban planning. So in the land use planning it is really on the lowest level. Recently, um, a, a process of decentralization was set forward mainly because of the state wanting to push down more responsibilities to the lower levels. Uh, but at the same time, a new planning law uh, uh, was put into place, uh, which has actually led to uh, other types of uh, organization. And I will just run through the different scale levels uh, that we have, which is connected to that. Um, so, first of all, of course, the Netherlands, the Hansstad being here with the four major cities. Uh, the Netherlands, uh, there are at least four departments with 
departments which actively are involved in planning the Netherlands. So, uh, transport, uh, economic affairs, agriculture, um, and, and, uh, and housing and spatial planning separately. So each of them separately uh, looking at the Hansel area, each of them um, are since the new planning law obliged to make a vision document. So what is uh, ahead and at the same time statutory plans of what is important on the level of the nation, what needs to be implemented. Um, then we have the provinces, 12 in the Netherlands, in the one stop consist of four provinces. For them, same. They need to make a vision document and they need to say what is very important to them and make statutory plans for, for that. So, this is an example of the South Netherlands vision plan. And then uh, on the lowest local scale level, the municipal level, within the Randstad, more than a hundred. So I would say it's, it's more or less like the district level uh, and, and, as it is here. Um, and each of them, again, are obliged to make a vision plan, say what's important for them, and bring it down to the land use plan. But there's no um, formal governing body, uh, body responsible for the metropolitan Randstad scale. So for this intermediate scale, there is no formal uh, way. Because actually, the Randstad only exists by name. And also, it's very difficult. There's hardly any uh, combined knowledge on this uh, scale level. Uh, and uh, of course, there are uh, processes that are starting to happen to, uh, to, uh, to sort of change that. Maybe just to give you an idea of the scale, so the Randstad, over 100 municipalities, uh, the distance between Rotterdam and Amsterdam is, is about 60 kilometers. I think some, somewhat the uh, sort of same distance as uh, Kaohsiung and Tainan somewhat sort of 60 kilometers, so very close to each other, and then the Hague and Utrecht also very closely uh, packed. And one of the ways of dealing with a sort of larger scale levels is the institution of what's called city regions. Um, four of them are organized around the four major cities. They take care of uh, transport planning. Um, and in the Randstad, um, at the, um, on the other hand, also, the division of the north wing and the south wing is installed as a, as a way of uh, channeling uh, new investments by the state. Um, and this is actually one of the most powerful um, ways of working on this uh, metropolitan level. There's a coming together of a biannual meeting uh, of administrators to uh, ask themselves what should we invest in in these two parts. And of course the state makes use of the fact that it cut up the Hansel into two, having a uh, sort of competition going on between the two wings. But finally I want to also uh, look into the possibility of other ways uh, of uh, addressing uh, the skill of the Hansel, uh, most notably a, a more or less informal ways of doing it. Uh, so, in recent years, an association of, of uh, a large group of parties started to work together, and these are not only uh, these are not only uh, uh, the is, uh, is wrong, but uh, these are not only public bodies. So the cities are organized within them: Amsterdam, Rotterdam, all of the big cities, uh, but also um, uh, a coalition between. Um, and private enterprises and, and let's say more civic uh, organizations. It's, it's content-driven uh, um, coalitions. And one of the things that the two things that are that are being done at that moment is is it constructs a platform of discussion and it serves as a laboratory for installing new uh, ideas or articulating new challenges. Um, and I will just show a couple of slides of things which are going on at the moment. So this is the current uh, railway system uh, in the Randstad with all of the stations and the new high-speed rail line connecting Rotterdam and Amsterdam to Paris. 
Um, and this is not only a railway system, but it's also a system which connects the different parts of the Randstad within the direct vicinity when you look at this map almost half of the urbanized fabric lies in the direct vicinity of one of these stations it was not only until the moment that we drew this map that we realized that this system is there and it's actually not used up to the most um, so there is a process which is going on at the moment which looks at intensifying land use in all of these nodes and this setting forward an intensity in frequency in mobility. But of course this doesn't happen by itself. So there are all, why, all kinds of ways why it doesn't happen. It's knowledge which is not there. It is not, uh, there's no uh, idea of the uh, articulation of the challenges. Um, so within this sort of informal setting there is a possibility to exchange this knowledge so this is a process which is going on at the moment. There's a, a database being formed of all of these stations and it's being shown where new developments are currently already going on. Around 20% of all of these station areas is changing. But into what? So new ideas of what kind of urban fabric can fit where along the line is put forward and less but most notably, I would say, um, there's also the uh, institution of uh, recognizing which people, which stakeholders are involved in this program, pro process and starting to um, try out by means of uh, new uh, technologies like, uh, like this one um, to see the way forward. So this is a, an example of a serious game which was uh, uh, built around this subject, uh, which is played over and over with different types of stakeholders, with different types of administrators, in order to envision what are the possibilities of this larger skill level. So maybe I leave it at that.